there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. A hot summer afternoon in the Northeast. Residents of New York and Toronto look forward to the weekend. No one could predict what is about to happen. Doors shut quickly at City Hall. Nobody was allowed in because the metal detector... Massive power blackout hit the United States and Canadian cities. Closing nuclear power plants. 100 power plants shut down and 50 million people in two countries. Emergency has been declared in New York State. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York City... In a matter of seconds, 50 million people simply fall off the grid. Phone lines and water systems fail, and thousands of people are trapped in elevators and subways. People start to panic, you know, like, we couldn't breathe. It'll be okay, honey, it'll be all right. It is August 14th, 2003, and the largest blackout in North American history causes six billion in damages. The official cause? Overgrown trees on power lines. But there's more to this story than troublesome trees. Just three days earlier, on August 11th, someone, somewhere, released one of the most damaging computer viruses ever written. Blaster. It was probably the biggest attack against the internet ever. Nico Hippinen is one of the world's most respected virus hunters. It is here, at F-Secure, an antivirus lab based in Helsinki, that he and his team first identify Blaster when it hits the internet. What astonishes Miko is the impact the virus has on the physical world. Blaster was the first worm that really showed that an attack like this can affect society and a normal life. Air Canada passengers were frustrated by long check-in lineups today after a virus overwhelmed some of the airline's computer networks. As Blaster explodes across the net, Air Canada's check-in system shudders to a halt. And 3,000 kilometers south, Amtrak and CSX railroad services are disrupted, delaying train routes in 23 states. We saw planes stopping and trains stopping and boats stopping. We saw infections with military installations. And then, of course, three days later, there was the US blackout. Did a computer virus somehow contribute to this? In the 21st century, most of us have had a run-in or two with a virus. They're usually the reason our computers act strangely or slow down. But Blaster was a new kind of threat. It used to be that viruses traveled the internet by piggybacking on other programs. They would arrive at your computer in the form of email attachments. The virus could not activate until someone opened the attachment. But Blaster was a worm. Worms don't need other programs. They propel themselves through the net. And they are self-activating. In other words, you could get Blaster simply by being connected. You would get infected just by having your PC online. You could be sleeping and your machine would get infected. Which meant anything connected was susceptible. Systems like the financial network, water treatment centers, and power plants. In one case, we know that a virus got into the major nuclear reactor in Ohio. Nine months after the blackout, the official report stated that Blaster, despite being released just three days earlier, played 
no significant role in causing the huge shutdown. Some security experts remained unconvinced, pointing to more than just the timing of the two events. If you read the blackout transcripts of the operators who were in the middle of this when it was happening, what keeps coming up in the transcripts is, is comments that, you know, stuff isn't moving, there are screens for freezing, which is exactly what the blaster worm does. Whether the blaster virus caused the 2003 blackout remains a contentious issue. But after blaster, no one doubted that online viruses could cause real-world damage. It's been actually a real learning exercise for potential attackers and terrorists to see, oh, well, if an accident can cause this, maybe we could cause it as well. Eric Byers is a former instructor at the British Columbia Institute of Technology. He researches the dangers of connecting critical infrastructure to the internet. There's no question that you could build a virus um, to take down the critical infrastructure. For example, our power systems, our water systems, our transportation systems, if those go away, then our life radically changes. Today, most critical systems are connected to the internet. And the computers these utilities use are the same Windows-based PCs that you might have in your kitchen. 95% of the machines are running Microsoft Windows. So when you have some sort of a worm or a virus or some sort of threat spreading that affects Windows, it spreads like wildfire. A Canadian oil company um, came to us and said, you know, we have this, this big infrastructure and we're curious, you know, can somebody uh, attack this? So Eric went to work. Using only a laptop and some basic hacker software, he easily broke into the holding tanks at the company's refinery. So first of all, I'm going to do what's called cutoff visibility. Now I've fooled it so that the uh, operator doesn't know anything's, anything's going wrong in the field. And then I'm actually going to blow up the tank farm. And you can see that all of a sudden, this pump has just gone nuts. And pretty soon, that tank's going to be overflowing. And in real life, uh, somebody be walking around with an oil spill. I wish that I could say, nope, um, all our critical infrastructure is secure, but it's not. If connecting power plants and oil refineries to the internet is putting them at risk, why not leave them unplugged? For business, for business reasons, for business efficiency. Mary Kerwin is a security consultant and a columnist for the Globe and Mail. One executive interviewed said that he thought it was, it was fine, it was worth taking the risk so they'd have an edge on the competition by having these open and secure hookups between the utilities and, uh, and the corporate network. The problem is the internet was never designed to be secure. It was never actually built to do a lot of the things we're using it for right now. Uh, it was not meant to be an engine of commerce. It was not meant to hold your banking information. In the late 1960s, researchers began developing a network that could share information between computers. In the 90s, it went public and exploded. It was no longer just a handful of scientists on the internet. It was now anyone with a modem. When you have 25 people on a network, you can be pretty sure they're going to play well. But when you've got 2 billion people on a network, you can be pretty sure that somebody is not playing fair. There are no secure computers. Uh, there are no secure networks. Amit Yoran is the former director of cybersecurity within the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. I think sooner or later, uh, we are going to be hit by a cyber failure uh, that will affect uh, either our nation's infrastructure or international infrastructures in a very significant and harmful way. So the implication is, is that somebody remotely managed to gain access to these control systems and does that type of damage and leaves the economy at a standstill, essentially, because without our ability to bank online, to make a phone call, to switch on the lights. We're literally in the dark.
Like most viruses, Blaster had no specific target. Its damage was collateral, releasing it an act of cyber vandalism, something a kid might do. Most of the time when these guys get grabbed, if and when they get grabbed, it was just for sport or their pals or they were sitting in their schoolroom in Germany and somebody annoyed them so they decided to play a game and write viruses or whatever. So usually they have, uh, particularly the kids, they have no clue of what they're doing and that's why they can be very dangerous. They're called hackers. Some would say they're nothing more than hobbyists, kids mostly. But hackers grow up too. We are the people that, that are behind the scenes of everything that you take for granted on the internet. It's us. There are three types. The white hats are the good guys. They're the virus hunters or the IT people at your office. The black hats are the bad ones. The virus writers or the crooks who try to steal your credit card number online. And then, somewhere in the middle, are the gray hats. They work both sides of the street, guns for hire in a Wild West industry. Tell us who you work for, Donnie. <laughs> uh, let's go somewhere else right now. Donnie makes his living as a professional hacker. Exactly how, he won't say. He is sometimes hired by companies to hack into their own systems. It's called penetration testing. That's where you get permission to break in, just as a real hacker would, but you are under a contract. And that's so that they can identify their security flaws and fix those security flaws before a bad guy really does. Like most professional hackers, Donnie has an infamous past. I was approached initially by this company in India. They wanted a demonstration of my skill set, so to speak. I ended up compromising um, five different systems with five different um, exploit vectors. Looking further into one of the intrusions, I had indeed broken into mail.gov.in. For all intents and purposes, I took down their government infrastructure. I had free reign on, on the systems all I wanted. I was able to plant back doors and gain later access. I was able to um, read emails. I was able to um, record keystrokes. In hacker parlance, we would say that I owned India. I, I owned a small country. Not, no, not small. I own the second largest country in the world. We asked Donnie to demonstrate his skills. In less than five minutes, he's broken into the database of a major international airline. So basically, I'm one step away from grabbing all of the reservation information, all of the user information, which would include your name, your address, your telephone number, um, your credit card information for verifying your flight. With power like this at your fingertips, we wonder what potential damage a group of dedicated hackers could cause. We could certainly shut down the United States critical infrastructure, I would assume, probably within a day. Um, dedicatedly, um, I would give it one week of research, one day to take it down. And that means what? what is the... That means taking out the power grid, it means taking out the communication power, it means taking out probably the military capacity of the United States to, to function properly. We would probably go into a police state at that point. Is that an exaggeration? No, I don't think so. Hacking is a growth industry. There are now books, magazines, and classes that teach hackers how to breach internet security. There are even hacker conventions. DEF CON, held every year in Las Vegas, is the largest. Can you imagine 7,000 hackers loose in the entertainment capital of the world? DEF CON isn't your average convention. It's cash only at the door, which isn't such a bad idea. With 7,000 hackers afoot, it's probably the last place you'd want to use your credit card. Well, DEF CON's been going on a long time now, various degrees of notoriety, um, hacking their badges and hacking each other and hacking each other's cell phone and can be a dangerous thing to attend. At DEF CON, you can learn how to pick a lock, 
electronic or otherwise. Or how to hijack a digital billboard. And though most attendees are hackers, there's also more than a few federal agents. In more recent years, you have so many undercover FBI agents that uh, it's hard to tell law enforcement apart from the, from the real deal. Depending on who you talk to, the FBI are there to either spy on the hackers or recruit them. We seek out the rock star hackers to find out what the cutting edge threats and vulnerabilities and tomorrow's issues and problems are, because they know. Somebody told us it's easy to spot the FBI. They're the guys over 35. And today, with software designed for children as young as six months old, a new and far younger generation of hackers is right behind this one. When we return, how a 15-year-old hacker paralyzed the Internet's biggest players. If they were up and they were online, they could be shut down. In the shady online world of the hacker, there is no one more notorious than Mafia Boy. A surprise move today by the Montreal teenager known as Mafia Boy. He admitted in court he is the hacker who crashed several popular websites last winter. The turn of the millennium saw the peak of the first dot-com gold rush. Internet giants like Yahoo, eBay, and Dell.com were doing hundreds of millions of dollars in online business every day. But in February 2000, these sites suddenly found themselves at the mercy of a 15-year-old kid. Michael Calce, AKA Mafia Boy, a high school student from Montreal. My dad got me a computer when I was extremely young. I was six years old. It just, it just, I don't know, it fascinated me what I could do with this machine. At 12, Michael was already a respected hacker. And by the time he was 15, he was asked to join what was then one of the most powerful hacker groups online. And I felt honored at the time, you know, we're talking about TNT Force. This was a big Russian hacker group uh, that had a big, big foundation and serious programmers in it. As TNT's newest member, Michael was eager to show off his skills. He hatched a plan to destroy a rival hacker gang by building the ultimate online weapon. I'm gonna make a new tool, something that is so powerful people have never seen before, and they're gonna run for their lives and wish they were never hackers. But before he attacks his enemies, Michael must first test the weapon. He picks a target, Yahoo. To this day, the biggest, busiest, and most profitable website in the world. It really never entered his mind that one of the most important sites on the internet, one of the most valuable e-commerce companies out there, would actually get taken out by what he built. In the early morning hours of February 7th, 2000, Michael prepares his attack. He puts the weapon on a timer, thereby creating an alibi, and then heads off to his grade nine classroom. So he's sitting in a classroom, and the teacher's talking, and Mike isn't paying any attention because all he's thinking about is three, two, one, it's launched. And at 10 a.m., what is still the largest internet attack in history begins. I got home. I was just dying to get on the computer and see exactly what the results were. And I realized it was more than successful when I got home because Yahoo.com was still down. Michael's weapon launched a direct assault on Yahoo computers. It was called a denial of service attack. Every time you access a website, you make a request from that site's computers. What Michael did was harness the bandwidth of dozens of larger computers, mostly from universities in the US. By turning them all onto Yahoo and making millions of requests every second, he crashed Yahoo's site. It's like if you call a pizza place and the phone is busy, it means that they're dealing with too many phone calls. Same thing. I bombard them with so many requests, they're just offline. Even today, there are very few defenses against this kind of attack. 
After seeing Yahoo collapse, Michael got a little carried away. CNN, Amazon, eBay, Dell, all multi-billion dollar companies, all easily shut down by Mafia Boy. CNN was probably one of the biggest attacks because they lost 1,200 other sites when CNN.com went down. Everything linked to CNN just went poof with it. I started to realize I had something way more powerful than I could imagine here. I felt a sense of it before, but this was the moment I realized, you know, there's not much that can stop me here. The attacks made headlines around the world and sent shockwaves rippling through the new economy. You have a situation where the price of these companies that were hit, they take hits on the stock market. You have the Attorney General of the United States standing up and saying that we will get the ones who are responsible for this. You have President Clinton convening a cybersecurity summit at the White House and talking about finding ways to fend off future attacks like this. The first reports came out, they were estimating the damage to be $1.7 billion damage. All from a Pentium 133. It was Michael's bragging that eventually got him arrested. He served eight months in a juvenile home. But he left a legacy. Suddenly, the internet didn't seem like such a great place to do business after all. People didn't really realize the extent to which the internet was vulnerable until a 15-year-old kid kind of showed them. I think it, in a sense, showed that the emperor had no clothes that the thing experts had known all along that building e-commerce on top of the internet is maybe not the best idea. It also showed that there wasn't a coordinated strategy in the government, in industry, to actually combat and fix a lot of these flaws and to fight off these attacks. The internet has little to no law enforcement. It's simply too big, too international, and too anonymous. It's very difficult to identify who is online at any one time, where do they come from, and they can just disappear into the ether. Just take out their connection and they're gone. They're like, like specters, like ghosts. For the most part, black hats target one company and its ubiquitous operating system. Now, this company is looking for a little vigilante justice. Microsoft established an antivirus reward program um, that will pay people if they provide information on a virus writer and it leads to an arrest and conviction. It's a cash bounty, $250,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of anyone who has written a destructive virus. We asked Donnie if he was up for the challenge. I don't know if it's entirely possible. It's really, really hard to identify the creator of a piece of code. A piece of code can be as small as four lines um, that you can, anybody could type out on a computer anywhere. If I were to successfully track someone down and actually be able to obtain this uh, bounty, so to speak, $250,000 um, would be enough to secure my future. His target, a Microsoft Word virus so-called because it hides inside a Microsoft Word document that the author then emails across the internet. Where Blaster was mindlessly destructive, simply flooding the internet, the Microsoft Word virus is much more sinister. After infecting a computer, it begins to collect documents. It then sends these documents back to the authors of the virus. The range of documents being collected concerns Donnie. CAD drawings for computer-aided design, spreadsheets, PDF documents, architectural and machine blueprints. The nature of the data that's being taken, to me, it, 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 it's, it goes straight to our critical infrastructure. It goes straight to the core of um, the United States military. And the virus is known to have targeted power systems and government agencies. It is, literally, spyware. Oh. 
Donnie's first stop in his search for the authors is Russia, home to the blackest of the world's black hats. We may not be able to pull this off, but we can certainly try. When we return, the most lethal online threat yet. The estimates are that it alone has infected 15 million machines. So there's this hovering, literally perfect storm of uh, potential attack. In the past few years, hackers and their viruses have evolved. Mischievous kids are no longer the main problem. Now it's all about the money. And viruses are designed expressly to steal your data. In the good old days, all the viruses were written by, you know, hobbyists and geeks and nerds in their basement for fun, for fame, really. And that started changing five years ago or so to professionals and criminals, people who do this to make money, even people who make millions. And while thieves used to break into your house, these days it's much easier for them to break into your computer. What they're looking for is personal information, credit card numbers and banking details, anything that can be sold for quick and easy cash. A hacker recently told me that uh, you know, identity theft is a, is a great new career. You know, it has great benefits. You know, why would you make minimum wage when you can stay in the best hotels and buy big screen TVs with somebody else's money? Today, TJX announced the theft of millions of credit card numbers and other personal customer information. In 2007, TJX, a department store giant with over 2,000 retail outlets around the world, found themselves the victim of the largest known internet theft to date. Attackers broke into their systems, probably over an insecure wireless network, and basically had the run of their network, as far as we can make out, for as much as 18 months, maybe even a few years, we're not entirely sure. Hackers downloaded credit card numbers, millions of them. The exact figure will probably never be known. Initial estimates of the numbers of individual credentials was around the 45, 46 million mark. In more recent filings, we believe it may be as much as 94 million. And credit cards aren't the only thing thieves took. Initially, we thought it was just credit card, bank card details. Over time, we discovered there were driver's licenses as well, which is much more significant. If you're getting into pieces of identification that can really allow identity thieves to build identities from the ground up. The thieves were able to break into the system by using a hacker trick called war driving, basically driving around with a laptop and a homemade antenna, often just an empty Pringles chip can covered in tinfoil. Hackers use this antenna to search for unprotected wireless connections. Once they find one, they break in and steal everything on your computer. I've known people who remain nameless who do this for fun, and they're, what they're doing is trying to spot open wireless connections. And they will show you sometimes uh, on their computers the number of, uh, in some cases, uh, Fortune 500 companies, perhaps, that may have open network connections. Finding open connections isn't difficult. Nowadays, they're almost everywhere. I've seen it in banks, uh, at the airport, all the time. You'll see the ticket counter have an open wireless port. Which makes catching the thieves almost impossible. Because they're wireless, the hackers are constantly in motion. The only way to catch one is in the act itself. Lowe's is a uh, you know, large uh, retailer of building supplies with you know, huge mega stores um, all over mostly the United States. And they recognized that somebody was hacking into their system. So they called in the FBI who deployed a couple dozen agents in a store in uh, Southfield, Michigan. And the agents, you know, were so unaware of what was actually happening, they thought that somebody was walking into the store and plugging into a network connection in the wall. But an agent on the roof noticed that there was a, a beat up old car in the parking lot with a Pringles can covered with tinfoil. And they said, maybe we should investigate that. And sure enough, uh, the driver of the car was hacking into Lowe's in order to steal credit card information, which was then to be sold to Russian mafia in Detroit. 
Donnie shows us how quick and easy war driving is. In the past five minutes, the bell has gone off, um, looks like about 64 times. And what does that mean? Um, 65. That means that we found an access point. Some connected to somebody's wireless right now. If we were, let's say, someone with malicious intent, now I'd be able to go to, um, you know, whatever website or send emails so we can see that, um, you know, leaving your wireless open um, is just another avenue of attack that a hacker could use. War driving isn't the only easy-to-learn hacker trick. Nowadays, the internet is bursting with hacker toolkits. These kits are essentially highly developed and highly illegal. Bundles of programs that allow even the beginner to become a junior cyber thief. If you're looking for a hacker's toolkit, you can just download them off the web. There's lots of them out there. Um, they're easy to find. And there are most of them, uh, in fact, many of the best are absolutely free. For example, there's some virus writing kits I was showing a little while ago. You basically select the type of virus you want to write and it builds a virus. Nowadays, you don't need much skill to become a cyber criminal. You just need the software. I don't think that it's ever been easier to launch an attack that can cause damage or that can steal sensitive information. It's a Google search away. It doesn't make that person a hacker, but it certainly makes them dangerous. With the abundance of toolkits, you'd think you'd hear about cyber attacks more often. But some companies choose to keep that information to themselves. If you have a cyber incident, you know, traditional best practice is cover it up, right? Don't, you know, don't tell anybody about it. Currently, there are few laws that force companies to disclose cyber criminal activity. And most organizations aren't that eager to make their customers nervous. They don't want their customers to know that 10 million credit card numbers got stolen. They don't want to have to disclose that. They don't want their stock price to take the hit. It's important for security researchers out there to be able to share data and to see how attacks are evolving. But if companies won't even admit they've been attacked, let alone show how it happened, how are we supposed to get better? It's a real problem. Once thieves have your information, they sell it to the highest bidder, often advertising it in a thriving online black market. That's the biggest development in uh, internet security in the last two and a half years has been the advent of markets for identities. In the black market, working credit card numbers go for as little as a dollar each. There's sampling, just like there's in the drug trade, where they'll, they'll give you 10 to test, and then you test them, oh, they're all good. You know, I could, I could uh, actually get money out of them or buy something with them. And full identities, which can include social insurance numbers and addresses, sell for as little as $5. There's been cases where kids have made up to $150,000 in six months from various types of credit card fraud and uh, phishing schemes and, and have gone on a spree of electronics buying. In the past few years, cybercrime has exploded. Some reports put it on a par with the drug trade. And a 2006 survey found it was more costly to businesses than conventional crime. And most of it comes from one place. When you think today about, you know, what, what's this sort of country of hacking right now, I think most experts would, would point to Russia. A few years ago, the Russian mob, sensing a unique opportunity, went online. And why not? It was less risky than traditional crime, and the internet allowed the mobsters to go international. All they needed was a few programmers. You have actual organized crime in Russia recruiting promising young programmers um, and other technical people to work in a cybercrime syndicate. These Russian syndicates are responsible for the bulk of viruses and hacker exploits released onto the internet every day. It took 20 years to go from the very first viruses to 250,000 viruses. And that's where we were in the beginning of 2007. By the end of 2007, we were already at 500,000 viruses. So we effectively doubled the amount of all of the malware in one single year. Because of this, internet security has become a booming business. In the past few years, antivirus labs have sprung up all over the world. 
Kaspersky in Moscow is one of the biggest. We receive over 2,000 of new viruses, trojans, and worms every day to this lab. In order to provide constant and non-interrupted protection, uh, virus analysts have to work every hour, every day of the week. We have a special uh, name for them. They are called woodpeckers. That's because they hammer their keyboards very fast. Donnie seeks help tracking down the authors of the Microsoft Word virus. He gets in contact with a group of Russian cyber criminals. These guys are really no different than a, a criminal ring that uh, would be specializing in uh, stolen car parts or, or uh, you know, stolen electronics, where they're trying to turn it, sell it, launder the money, and you know, get some side of, type of percentage out of it. One of the group agrees to meet with Donnie in a cafe. The Russian tells Donnie that he's part of a hacker crew that works primarily as carters. They steal credit card information and then sell it online. Yes, uh, for a year or something, like a card, we, how can you say, we hustle. Well, the leader of one crew that I was working with, he makes like from nine to $15,000 a week. I had no idea it was that kind of money. I mean, I was thinking like, you know, thousand dollars a week. Donnie then inquires about purchasing viruses that would allow him to steal information from anyone's computer. So, um, you know, one of the things that I'm also interested in is um, Trojans and backdoors. Yes. Exactly. It's gets until like one hundred, one thousand dollars. Really? Yes. Five thousand bucks for a Trojan. From uh, four hundred to one thousand. Wow, that's insane. That's but not all viruses have such a clear purpose. In 2007, a new type of virus appears on the internet. Stormworm. It infects without warning and seemingly without consequence. And to this day, no one knows what its purpose is. People often ask me about how, how do I know if I'm infected by storm? And you really don't, because it doesn't show you any messages, it doesn't destroy anything, it doesn't play any music or anything, any of the fun stuff we used to see with old school viruses. It's really invisible. Not just invisible, but impossible to detect. This is because it's always changing. This worm keeps morphing itself. Every time you download it, you get a different copy. And if you do find it and try to remove it, the worm attacks. But the biggest reason Stormworm is making headlines around the world is that it turns a computer into a so-called zombie or robot. The author of Stormworm can then control your computer, now a zombie, remotely without you knowing. The zombie computer means a computer which is no longer in control of its owner. The person who actually owns the PC doesn't see this. He, he thinks the PC works just fine, but there's someone else behind the scenes who has access to that machine and can do whatever he wants on that machine, over the network, any time of day he wants. The worm infects thousands of PCs, creating thousands of zombies. The author of the worm then links all of the zombies together, creating a robot network, or botnet. So the idea of, of these botnets is that uh, characters who manage to get bad code onto your computer, they own your computer, you know, they have, I like to call it the key under the mat. They can come back anytime they like. They, you don't know even that they're there. Once you have a botnet at your disposal, you can use the combined power of all these computers at the same time. So you can, for example, send an instruction that all of those machines start to send as much traffic as they can against one single website. That's a denial of service attack. The same type of attack Mafia Boy used to take down Yahoo. There are Russian botnet operators right now selling denial of service attacks launched from their botnets by the hour or by the day. 
What's unique about Stormworm's botnet is its size and sophistication. Experts estimate the number of linked computers to be in the millions. But still, no one knows this botnet's purpose. The estimates are that it alone has infected 50 million machines, and it has not been used for anything. So there's this hovering, literally perfect storm of uh, potential attack. So the concern is that, that the storm worm has created all these compromised computers that in themselves create a kind of an almost a massive supercomputer. And that if very bad people have control of this, they may be able to do very bad things on a very, very big scale. Donnie continues his search for the authors of the Microsoft Word virus. He asks his source if the Russians are involved. They're getting like CAD drawings and design, design features from, from companies like that are making like missiles, that are building like subcontractors for the, the it's, army. It's a hang. We don't get into it of people that do it. So I don't know nothing about it. So you it. don't know anything no. about this Microsoft Word virus? I mean, some people tell me, uh, you know, this stuff is coming, the Russians are using. In China, is, yes, they have the technology and they have everything. So they're the most uh, people who get into hype. So like they're going for the big things. Big things. Yes. When we return, the specter of cyber warfare, nations attacking nations. I think y you have to concern yourself with the possibility of a digital Pearl Harbor. In April of 2007, Estonia suddenly found itself on the losing side of a battle with the largest country on Earth. What began as a protest over Estonia's relocation of a Soviet war memorial quickly turned ugly. Riots broke out and Russian hackers launched what some people call the world's first cyber war. What happened in Estonia was a major cyber attack. Somebody tried to harm the country, the government of the country, the financial organization of the country. Cyber warfare. It's a terrifying premise, and up until recently, mostly hypothetical. Estonia was particularly vulnerable. Like Canada, it is one of the most wired countries on Earth. More than 78% of the Estonian citizens are doing their banking business via the Internet. In a place where most people bank online, attacking the Internet makes everyone a little nervous. Down to the point that people may ask, is my money still in the bank if, that, if, if I don't have access to my money? Within minutes, hackers shut down the banks. They also targeted broadcasters, newspapers, and government offices. We saw the single largest attack against all of the infrastructure of a single country we've ever seen. And it really started to affect the everyday life of people. And though the Russian government denies any involvement, there's no doubt the attacks were politically motivated. We don't have solid evidence that this is related to any governments. However, we have reasonable evidence to believe that this uh, has its roots in Russian Federation. At one time, the U.S. saw Russia as the main cyber warfare opponent. As early as 1998, the country was accused of hacking into U.S. government systems. But these days, America fears a new cyber spy, China. That is the country that we're most worried about. Rick Howard is a retired lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Army. He spent the last two years of his career as the chief of the Army's Computer Emergency Response Team, the cyber SWAT team of the U.S. military. China, in their own doctrine, their own military doctrine, says they'll be ready to take on the U.S. by 2025. They're not going to do that tank on tank. That's not what their plan is. Their plan is to go at us with asymmetric warfare, using the Internet as part of their attack vehicle. Rick believes that Chinese hackers are currently mining U.S. government computers, using tools that are similar to the Microsoft Word virus. They steal 
every document on those hard drives, every Word document, every PowerPoint document, every Excel document, and they bring them back to China. We're talking about millions of documents. Stealing national secrets over the net has replaced old-fashioned espionage. But Rick's greatest concern is that the Chinese military is training and recruiting hackers. The PLA in China uh, recruit hackers from um, the Chinese population, and they train them in military information warfare tactics. They give them a regular salary so that they can go and try to penetrate uh, U.S. government and other government institutions. In 2007, the U.S. claimed China cyber-attacked the Pentagon. The Chinese government officially denies these claims. So how vulnerable are we to a cyber-attack? And what exactly would it mean? The complete breakdown of financial health, traffic, air traffic, government structure of a country. You have to concern yourself with the possibility of a digital Pearl Harbor. I think there's, a, there's, there's always the possibility that a rogue terrorist group were to have a very significant denial of service attack. And if there's anything that people need to understand in cyberspace is that this is hard stuff. You have to take it serious. So if and when an attack comes, are we ready? Donnie abandons his pursuit of the Microsoft Word virus. He reasons that now it's too risky. We're not just looking at black hat hackers, we're not looking at kids, we're not looking at script kiddies, but we're really looking at a coordinated effort uh, sponsored by the Chinese government um, against uh, not only the United States, but the West in general. He's not as interested in collecting the bounty as he once was. The, the percentage of it being successful is really low, in my personal opinion. And like a true gray hat, he's already onto something else. So, who are you working for now, Donnie? I'm not going to comment on that. Fair enough. Michael Calce has written a book about his life as a notorious hacker. I couldn't stand back knowing what was going on and what's going to happen and how, how bad it's getting. Eight years after his attack, he says he could do it all over again if he wanted to. Because they haven't done anything about it. They say they're investing this into internet security and this and that, but the situation is only getting worse for everybody. Attacks are increasing. The number of viruses has doubled in a year. And places like the Pentagon ward off a cyber attack nearly every day. Is cybersecurity a significant threat to the critical infrastructure of Canada and the world? Absolutely, no question. This is serious stuff. It is supposed to be a little bit turbulent. It is supposed to be a little bit uncontrollable. And to have that openness and that freedom, you have to deal with the other things. The interconnected nature of the internet and critical infrastructures is a point of significant vulnerability for modern society. We really have to think carefully about putting critical infrastructure online. I would prefer critical stuff to be disconnected. And when I mean disconnected, I mean that they are in separate cables. Increasingly, all aspects of our lives are funneled through the internet. What's at stake is impossible to dismiss because the 9-11 Commission, their summary of the 9-11 events was that it was a failure of imagination. And I think the one thing we don't want to do again is for our imaginations to fail. <laughs>